He has cultivated a career as one of Australia's most prolific sports journalists, asking the tough questions of the most decorated and outlandish characters of our great game. But tonight, the tables turn on Mike Sheehan. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Ben. And remember the advice your mother gave you about respect for elders, OK? <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel to sit in the chair across... Bit odd, I must side? say, yeah. Um, I'm, I, two things I'm amazed at, how nervous I am and how cool you are. <laughs> I don't really feel very cool don't inside, you? Mark. <laughs> you look cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, let's talk about open mic first. Have you got any highlights from open mic in your career? Uh, so I hope so. We've done 180 of them. Yeah, um, everyone out there who's seen it will say the Mark Jackson one was the highlight. To me, it was a low light. But this, look, I, because I'm so invested in this program, I think most of them have been good to very good, you know, because I pick the subjects and I do the research. Uh, and I've been overall really happy with the way they've turned out. If I had to pick two or three, Matty Lloyd, I loved doing the Matty Lloyd story and how honest he was. Uh, Nathan Brown this year. Um, and on the other side, the, with the gravitas, like the Merv Kane story, the man who lost his wife and his daughter in the space of three weeks, uh, and other ones where people have talked about losing their children and death in the family. So um, I think I like to think there are lots of highlights. Mm. And how big is emotion for you in terms of a show like this? Yeah, it's really important to me. My, my view is that shouldn't be a story about blokes kicking goals and taking marks and winning flags. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be their life. Um, and if there's emotion in it, which there is for most of us, uh, I try to dig into that and find that out. Have you got any regrets in terms of your sports journalism career? Yeah, I have. Too many to mention, Benny. Um, I mean, of course you... Because one in particular springs to mind for me, and that's, um, I suppose, the Alastair Clarkson one in 2013. How did you know do you, all this stuff? Do you, do you have a... <laughs> do you have a sort of... You weren't supposed to do all this research. <laughs> you were supposed to come on and have a, a nice <laughs> informal chat with me. Uh, the Clarkson one, yeah, the, I, I got that wrong. Yeah, you and I have known each other for a long period of time, um, and I reckon you put your journalism above our friendship because it's so far from the truth, it's not funny. But what, so far, how far from the truth? I mean, the truth is that West Coast went to, uh, to Hawthorne and inquired about your availability. Uh, irrespective of that, um, you know, Melbourne did that too, and nearly every club does it when, there's a, when they're out of a coach. They ask those that are in jobs just because that's their, that's their due diligence. But irrespective of what approach is made, you said that I'm definitely going. Um, now, I reckon that you owe me a phone call, or at least Pickers, to inquire about that before you're running on such an important occasion as Grand Final Week. It just reminded me yet again, even at my old age, that uh, it's all in the preparation. And, and I took a risk that night and it backfired. Is it hard to maintain friendships in the football world when you are a sports journalist? Yep. And I suppose that's the same for a lot of other industries. Yeah. Journalists are involved yeah, it as is. well. It is. Because... We have to, when the crunch comes, when there's a big story, the story has to prevail over the individual. And, and the individuals don't like that. And I think sometimes they think they've been duped. I think they think that we're their friends. But in the cold, hard light of day, it's got to be the story. And with the, with the Clarko one, he, he and I didn't speak for probably two years, except for him to say that I was a flog. Every time we crossed paths or he was talking about me, Sheehan's a flog. So I knew that that uh, upset him, and, and rightly so. It, was, it happened uh, on the eve of a grand final, which they ended up winning, and I was a bit reckless with uh, the information that I had. What about now? Uh, what, In terms of Clarko? Uh, you, yeah, no, we're OK. Do you okay. maintain your friendship now? No, we're, we're, well, I've, I've been out of newspapers for uh, six years now, so I don't cross paths with him like I used to. But we did a function at Metropolitan Golf Club recently uh, and I sat next to him and that was good. Well, I think we're OK now. Well, let's move on now. What about your, your daughter, Kate? Now, she's followed in this your shoes. Yeah. <laughs> does, that, does that make you a, a proud dad to know that she's followed in your footsteps into the, the well, media when I, game? When I see her on Fox Footy? Yeah. And I, and I think she's good at it and I, and I really enjoy that. It's, uh, but... You won't know this. It's too soon for you. You're having a baby, but you haven't got... When you've got kids, I mean, they become more important than how I perform. I mean, it's, it's more important to me how she performs than how I perform now. 
because you know she's making her way and I I watch her on telly and I just hope that everything goes well and she looks good which she does uh, and she makes sense so she's doing that and she's working at Richmond in charge of uh, the women's footy ops and loves that and is doing a good job so very happy with uh, with how she's going yeah now she she's actually helped me out with a little bit of research because she messaged me on Instagram last night and said, "Do you need any dirt?" Dirt. She said dirt. Did she? <laughs> I don't know. If she or said, info. I don't know if she used I'm those happy. words exactly. I'm happy if she if she helps you with information. I'd be disappointed if she was digging up some dirt on me. But in terms of, oh, I suppose this isn't dirt. But in terms of proud moments, um, she mentioned the time when she got her first AFL game, the yep. AFLW and how much that meant to you and to her as a father and daughter. Yeah. Maybe if you could talk a well, little bit about she's Well, her passion for football matches mine, and she's grown up um, with that. She loved Hawthorne when she was a kid and loved Dermot Brereton. Um, so it meant as much to her as it did to me when I was a kid. And when she finally got a game at, uh, at Collingwood, uh, first time, AFLW, she thought she'd been hardly done by until then. She got a game, we're out at the Witten Oval, the family was there. She took a ball, the first touch she had, uh, went to Bork, and the knee just gave way and she did her ACL. And uh, yeah, sometimes you sit there and you're not sure what you've just seen. And I'm looking at it crumpled in a crumpled heap on the ground. And the bloke in front of me knew who I was and he just turned around and she's, he said, she's done her ACL. And I said, you're kidding, aren't you? Anyway, down the rooms, doctor said, look, we fear the worst. And, and that's what happened. But the funny thing is about that, even though She's had the most talked about one possession in any competition in history. In her mind, she's been out there. Hmm. You know, she hasn't had a long and distinguished career, but she's been out on the ground at the highest level she can play, and I think that, that almost satisfies her. Yeah. How are we well, going? Here we go. I reckon we're going all right, okay. aren't we? <laughs> were you always supportive of her? In oh, her, yeah. In her AFL exploits growing yeah, up? Yeah, I was. Um, I mean, I've got four kids, so I don't want to make it all about her, but she's the one who pursued the footy dream. But I remember her mother said to me the day of her first game, I'm not sure I wanted to play football. She'll get injured, there'll be something happen. And I said, no, there won't, they're minor. There's a few of them, but not many. And that very day, she did her ACL. Mm. How do you feel about, and I suppose this is something that you and, and Kate have in common being in the media, criticism of your commentary on the game because people say that you never played at the highest level. And I suppose... Kate, to an extent, would get the same kind of messaging. Do, how does that make you fit? Does that annoy you? Well, it's double barrel for her because she's a female. So it's you, you never played and you're a girl and what would you know about it? That was the sort of the, um, the traditional way of looking at it. With me, um, it, it, it does irritate me. If I'm on, I mean, people would say though, lots of things irritate me. You know, the, uh, Clarkson calls me precious because I react to so many <laughs> things like that. So. Um, but uh, I, I should often take the view, well, I always take the view that you don't have to have played something at the highest level to understand what happens in the game. My view about football is whatever level you play, it's the same game, right? You still have to stand in front of a pack, you still have to bend down and take the ball when you're not sure what's around you, and you still have to kick a goal when it, it's important to your team. It's just that you blokes play it better than we did. But it's, it's, not, it's not a different game. And you did play footy at a reasonably high level and, and that's something that you and I actually have a fair bit in common in terms of our football upbringing and that you played football in Tasmania and at Werribee Footy Club and so did I. I did. Well, I'm glad you did that bit of research, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I, I never volunteer the stuff about having played football because I didn't play AFL and therefore you're always subject to that observation, well, what would you know you've never played? But yes, I did. I played at North Hobart for a year when I was down there working at the Mercury and I played... Uh, how many games did you play at Werribee? Uh, I, I played only a year there. So is that all? Been, yeah, yeah. So I moved over from Tassie. It would have been... But this is about you, Mike, so let's not go too far <laughs> into me. Well, um, nice socks too. Oh, thanks, yeah. yeah. Look, yeah. I pulled these out just for you. Did you really? Yeah, I did. Yeah, well, no, I, t I noticed it. Good touch. Um, <laughs> but well, I played what, what are your, what are your, games. What are, what are your um, memories of playing footy at Werribee in the VFA? Oh, they're pretty hazy. I mean, I wasn't a great player. Um, we were a team in second division. I, I loved it. Uh, I had a crack. Is there any truth to the rumour that after games you wrote about your own team's games under an alias? No, no alias. In the, no, no, you're half right. 
Uh -huh. Sadly, there's some truth in that. But okay. no, it was my own name. Um, and in fact, I was doing, I was bagging the blokes playing in the firsts when I was playing in the under 19s, <laughs> writing, did, writing for the local paper. How did they respond to that? Oh, how would you have responded to that? <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't like it much. That when I'd get to training on the Thursday night, there'd be six or eight papers on trestles in the in the room, and six or eight blokes not talking to me. You know, just that because I was a kid, uh, and just. I'm sure they were saying, what's this little upstart doing criticising the way we played the previous week? pretty ballsy. Yeah. Do, you think it takes, do you think it takes a little bit of that to make it as a sports journalist? No doubt. Journalist? No, and this is generic now. I'm talking about mm. all the good journos have been able to say, I'm going to say this, A, B or C, and I know that it's going to ruffle some feathers, but that's, that's my job. Is, uh, that, is that the hardest part of... Being a sports journalist. Well, probably is because AFL. because everyone likes to be liked. Even though we sort of say, you know, if I can speak for say Sheehan, Wilson, Robinson, all the journos that that um, well, there's lots more journos than that. But we we we're all human. We all sort of want people to like us. And when we go to the footy club, you know, the big names like Brown and <sighs> Zebel and all those that would say hello to us. But sometimes you just have to say, my job is to have. Uh, Consider the opinions about these blokes, and if it's uh, negative, so be it. And why is that so important to you? Because obviously it holds great importance if you've done this for so many years as you yeah. have. Yeah. To pursue that career like you like you have, and to be so prolific, there must be something deeper than that. Deeper than what? Deeper than just the job. Just the yeah, career. Yeah, no, it's not just a job. Do. No, it's not. I mean, it's the, uh, it's the extension available to us short of playing. I mean, we, we weren't good enough to play at AFL level, but we've, well, in my case, I've had 40-odd years in this industry that I love, um, but along the way, there have been clashes with, with people who I like. And, I mean, you lose some friendships, um, but, when it, again, I've repeat, when it's all paired away, our responsibility is to the person who's employing us. Uh, and we're, we're employed to have considered views about what we've seen and to express them. Yes. And, and I've and done that in newspapers and on radio and TV. Sometimes when I've finished that, I've finished, I said, why did I say that? But that's been my gut feel, uh, my instinctive feel to what I've seen, and that should be the, what drives you. And is that how you want to be remembered? Is that the legacy that you want uh, to leave? If I, if I, I don't think a lot about that, but... If, if I wanted to think about my legacy, it would be that I was considered and that I worked hard and that fundamentally I was fair. Now, some people don't say that. And, I mean, I, I, I clashed. I uh, crossed paths with Plugger, Plugger Lockett, Roger Merritt, Peter Dacos, Crackers Keenan. I mean, I wouldn't want to take three of those blokes on in the street. Sorry, Dakes, but, <laughs> but, I, but I wouldn't. I mean, but that was how I saw the events happening at the time. And to be honest to myself and to fulfil the role that I had, if you're a chief football writer for the Herald Sun in Melbourne, it's a big responsibility. People can say what they like about Sheehan and Robinson, who have now done it for the last 25 years, but we have to have a view about what we've seen. And no-one's going to pick up a newspaper constantly if they said everyone's a good bloke and they're, they're a great team. I mean, imagine at the moment if you sort of found excuses for Carlton. You just can't. So you've got to bash them. But people say you know, you leave them alone or have a, give them a breather. But you can't because that's what we do. Do, do you think there's too much negativity in the media? Um, you say that there could be more... That, that there should be negativity in the media. Yeah. Because Is we it don't want much? it to be, all be sunshine and rainbows. But do you yeah. think that there's too much negativity? P probably, yeah. I think when there's a game of football decided where the stakes are high... I think we tend to focus on the team that lost rather than the team that won. Then, I suppose the next question, do you enjoy watching footy today? And there's been a lot made of the state of the game lately. Yeah, yeah. Do you actually enjoy watching footy now or do you think that it was better <laughs> the way it was? Um, old people always say it was better the way it was. Uh, I, I've always maintained this and I'm still of the same view. The best football today is better than it's ever been. But... But conversely, there's a lot of rubbish today. But we see it all too. I mean, we've, um, nine games covered every weekend. So that didn't used to be the case. 
I mean, you see the match of the day or, and then highlights from, say, two, one or two or three others. But now there's all nine games on. So there's going to be some um, stuff that's below scratch. But I, I, I'm just a bit disturbed by the way most of the games are played, but I love the good games. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I don't, I don't think, I'm not sure my passion's as deep as it, as it used to be, though. Why is that? Oh, probably because I'm old. I mean, I think... Well, what do, you, do, do, you think, do you think that's just you, or do you think the game has to change? And if, if the game has to change... No, the game, no, the, no I, the game doesn't know me, my view about it. I mean, if, if I like it or I don't. But, I mean, people like Sheehan and Park and, and, and people of that ilk who have been in football for so long, we're probably a bit more discerning than most. I mean, if you ask kids about the way football's played today, and you're a kid, that's the game you grew up with. You're not comparing it with what we are. We saw it in the 60s and 70s and 80s. We've got a view about that. You've got no idea what happened then. So, therefore, you, people of your age are liking what they see because that's their game. Well, not everyone's liking what they see. What do you think of the standard of the game? I, I love it, but that's... I, I think that there's an element of that that's... I enjoy playing the game. Yep. I'm not a great watcher of sport, but a lot of people watching the sport at the moment don't like what they're seeing. So, so what... do, does there need to be anything change about the game well, to make it more of the ilk of the 60s and 70s when you watch the game? Do you think that would improve the look of the game? Probably, but, I, but I'm what, not, I'm what not in favour of revolution, though. I mean, I would think tinker with it. A few things that I would do and change without actually radically changing the way the game's played. Anything specific? Uh, well, I like the idea of... Uh, one, the one thing I do like, which is, which is radical, is that you can't take possession of the ball when you're on the ground which is a pinch, I think, from Gaelic football. Um, that, that you've just got to knock it on. If you're caught with it on the ground, it's a free kick. Because most of the congestion we have is born of someone being on the ground and ten blokes jumping on him and a ball up, and then a follow-up ball up. We're going to head to a break, but after that, I'll have some more for you, Mike. No, you won't. No. What's that? You're the goal kicker. I ask the questions. We're going to reverse the roles. If you say so. <laughs> Tables are turned again now, Benny. I'm asking the questions. Your questions were good, but you have done a journalism course, haven't you? Uh, yeah, so I did a um, Bachelor of Arts, um, majoring in journalism at uh, University of Tasmania, and then when I moved to Victoria, I finished it off at the Deakin University over here. So, Is the view that the journos, not the, not the ex-players, I'm not talking about Revolt and Dunstall and Brereton and those folks, is the view that the, the journos in print know much about it or don't know much about it? Um, to be honest, there's there's a lot of talk at footy clubs that you you shouldn't read stuff that's written in the paper but you about do. you. I mean, inevitably, you, you do. I mean, there's there's papers in front of us when we get to the footy club and that, like, you're going to run into stories. Mm. That's, that, that's hard to escape. But I suppose you're just trying not to take it on too much. I don't think we, I don't think we really worry. To, I, personally, I think that the people writing about sport know about sport Good um, in in general uh, and I think maybe that's because I've had a little bit of the the I suppose the journalism degree yep. as well yep. so yeah that's my thoughts I don't know whether everyone's the same no, I'm happy with that your mother taught you did she not uh, yeah she did oh, um, years 11 and 12 yeah towards the end of my schooling yeah she was the RE teacher at my school so and English uh, yeah a little bit of English a little bit of Whatever she could get her hands on. Was she Mrs Brown or Mum? <laughs> I, I called her Mum <laughs> when I could. <laughs> Did you really? I get away in, the, with it. in the classroom? Yeah. I think <laughs> my, my brothers have still taught by now. She teaches at Sacred Heart College down in Hobart. So, yeah, my brothers still deal with it now, probably a little bit longer than I did. Now, there's Manson blood in your family, isn't there? That's right, yeah. Uh, one of whom is Jimmy, who played for Collingwood. Like, like you, a distinctive kicking style, but different to you. Yeah. Um, Did you see him play? Different. I, I didn't see him play in terms of... I wasn't old enough to... I was born in 92 and he was towards the end of his career then, but I, my grandma and pop had lots and lots of old tapes of highlights of him playing. And, um, you know, we're, it's great for us now. We get all the edits um, of our games that get, get, get picked out so we can just go on a computer and click on our name and anything that we're in 
will be shown in in front of us. But my my grandma and my pop, I think, pioneered that mm. because they managed to clip out all the specific bits that James was involved in in a particular game. So I did get to watch a little bit of him playing, and I, I suppose he was a little bit of an idol for me growing up. Was you, we'd all consider him slightly awkward, and I think that's a, that's as much as we can praise that's... him the way he kicked. But his run up was probably five to seven metres. Yeah. Yours is probably 50 to 70. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon you've overdone it there a little bit, Mike. <laughs> what, what, where did you develop that uh, long run-up of yours? Um, I think it was probably o over a period of time. So back when I played in Tassie, I was, I was always a ruck. I never played key forward. Um, I'd only ever pinch hit forward for three or four minutes while someone else chopped me out in the ruck. So it wasn't actually until I played with the Tassie Mariners I had a, mm. in the under-18s. I had a little bit of exposure to playing as a key forward, but I was still primarily a ruck. Um, that was probably what prompted my move over to Werribee, was that I probably wasn't going to get that exposure to playing key forward um, in the TSL. So I went to... Well, Mark Stone came to me, actually, um, Werribee recruiter at the time, and... Um, of course, sports, sports journalist himself, and mm -hmm. came down two years in a row and had a coffee with me um, in Glenorchy uh, down in Tassie, and I suppose asked me to come along for a trial and um, met Scotty West the second year after he came down, and Scotty West said, oh, yeah, I reckon we can fit, fit you in. As it turned out, we had, at times that following year, um, Mason Wood, Majak Dor, Daniel Curry, Ben Warren, Ben McKinley and myself That's all playing in the same forward line. So it's a I good think we, size. Yeah. I think we play. I think we played with it around six key forwards at times. Now but, tell me, tell yeah. me, how far back you go from the mark, and and the other thing I've always been intrigued about: what goes through your head when you're on your way in? Um, I don't go back a specific amount. Of, I wouldn't know how far it is in metres back from the mark. Um, I think I've just done it enough times that I know. I suppose I just see ahead of me how far away the man on the mark is and mm. I can judge how, how far that is to the end of my mark. So I think having done that at training enough times and in games enough times, I know where to go and stand. Um, as far as when I'm coming in to kick, um, the first part of my routine is about visualisation. So putting the ball up to my face is seeing the ball travelling straight. Yep. After that, I, I kind of vary, but mainly it's around staying loose early in my run-up and then afterwards it's about keeping everything straight, following through at the target. And generally, if I don't get a goal, I can put it down to one of the things in my routine at least that I haven't followed through on and done well. What's your target? I, my pop actually, um, uh, my my pop was Jim Manson, mm -hmm. so he um, he was James's dad. He, he always told me growing up to pick out a spot behind the goals. And I still do that too. But what, a part of the furniture, as it were, or a person? Or uh, Depends how many are in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I like it to yeah. be a person. So, yeah. Um, yeah, if anyone thinks that I'm looking at them a little bit too intently when I'm running <laughs> in for goal, that's, that's why, because I've picked them out. Mm. Three in the first quarter at the weekend. Did you? Does it ever go through a full forward's mind that I could kick a dozen today? <laughs> I, it goes through your mind for about a split second, I think. Um, you know, there, there are certain quarters, certain times in the game where it just seems to come to you, but I think I've, I've kind of gotten to the stage now I've played enough games that I know that that's probably not sustainable and sometimes the ball doesn't come your way and it's not necessarily your turn. Um, but, yeah, on, on the weekend it just seemed to happen in that first quarter does, a little bit. Does the thought of winning the common, does that mean anything to you? Um, oh, no, nah, not really. I, I obviously want team success first. Mm. Um, It'd be nice, but I think beyond that, not really. Um, it's I, I feel like kicking goals is the way that I can help my team win and presenting for the ball, creating a contest, being able to pressure when the ball's on the ground. Those are all, the, I suppose, the key pillars of my game and kicking goals is part of that. And that's why I value um, kicking straight mm. as, as much as I do. Um, so I do a lot of practice at training on that. But I look, I don't think it'd... I don't think it'd mean. I don't think it'd be any different if okay. I won it as opposed to if I got third or fourth or tenth or whatever. Now you're not going to get out of that chair without one tough one. Um, we all saw Stephen May whack Sean Higgins off the ball and 
without sort of any hint that it was coming. What did you think of that? Uh, obviously, I didn't like it. And I think Higo's been copying that, um, I suppose, that treatment for a fair while now, this year. Um, does most weeks, not necessarily... They call them tummy taps. They mm. hurt a bit more than that. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, I don't like that kind of action personally. Um, I know that things happen in the heat of battle, and I, and I, you know, I don't want to decry Stephen May of. Should you anything, get rubbed out for it? I think personally, and act like that, you probably should. Mm. Um, just, and this isn't necessarily about Stephen May, but I just don't like the idea of hitting someone off the ball. Um, when they're not looking, when, well, particularly when they're not, yeah. particularly when they're not looking, I suppose, because um, it's just it's just not a part of the game. You're not you're not going to achieve anything by doing that um, in terms of trying to win your team the game. Mm. I think footy should be competitive. Footy should be about trying to win, and those kind of those kind of things don't necessarily help the team win. So, yeah. for you're, me, you're a but, vegan, aren't you? I am, yeah. Is it given the amount of energy you'd expend at training and playing? Um, is do you need meat or do you need dairy in your in your diet? Well, I've been vegan since the start of this year, and um, the year before I was pescatarian, so I ate fish and dairy products and eggs. Mm. Um, this year, I this year I've given that up and eat a vegan diet, and so far I haven't felt like I've been lower on energy at all. Um, I'm probably more aware of my diet now than when I was eating meat and as such I'm probably eating better now than what I did when I was eating meat because I'm hyper aware of what I need in order to get myself up to play on the weekend in order to get myself up day to day so I'm a lot of people ask about protein um, you know iron all these kind of things I'm pretty across all of that now and to be honest it hasn't really affected me at all what why did you why did you give up meat Oh, it was a it was a personal choice for me. So my my wife's vegan and she was vegetarian when I met her. So I think that had a big um, that played a big role in I suppose introducing me to um, some of the ethics surrounding um, my meat consumption, dairy consumption, etc. Um, I'm not a big one for um, telling other people what to do. Mm. I don't. I, I'm not trying to be a I suppose a health crusader or anything yeah. like that. Um, it's just a personal choice. I've decided that for me, if I can get what I need to perform um, at playing as an AFL footballer and day to day without eating meat and dairy, um, then I'll do it. And so that's why I'm doing it now. What about the hair? How often does uh, the hair see scissors? <laughs> Not that often. It did actually on last Friday, and it was the first time in. It was the first time in a little while. I reckon this is the shortest it's been in. Five or six years. Really? At the and all the boys in your family? There's about seven, isn't there? <laughs> there's, there's six of us. Six, yep. yeah. All, they all got the same mop? Uh, no, nah, they haven't grown it quite as long as me. Um, there's, some, there's at least some waves in some of the, some of the <laughs> others, but a few, few straight mops as well. Hey, Benny, it's been great fun. I've enjoyed it. Um, it was interesting to have the tables turned, but you did it well and it's been good to catch up. Yeah, well, thanks for joining me on Open Ben. Mike, for player takeover round. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks very much.